Dearly beloved, tonight, as you know, we celebrate the mystery of the Assumption of the Mother of God. We know by faith that the souls of persons who die in sanctity with no attachment to sin and no remaining punishment for their sins go directly to heaven. After Christ opened the heavenly gates through his glorious ascension, all the souls of the just joined him there, awaiting the resurrection of their bodies at the end of time. But for Our Lady, it is different. Since she was never subject to sin, either original or personal sin, it was not appropriate that she should bear the penalty of sin, which is death and the decay of our bodies. She willingly suffered death to be in union with her son, but she would not suffer decay, because it is not fitting for the Mother of God and the Temple of the Holy Spirit. This feast has many theological themes, but one most fitting for our days is the fidelity of God and the need for supernatural faith in the midst of our trials. According to St. Augustine, Our Lady made a vow of virginity when she was a girl, a vow which meant that she wished to be entirely consecrated to God in body and soul. She wanted to dwell perpetually with God and have Him dwell in her always as in a temple. That was her heart's desire, and that is why she asked the angel Gabriel how it could be that she could bear a son, because she knew that God knew that she had vowed her virginity and could not violate that vow to conceive naturally, even with her lawful husband. As we know, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and so she was able to keep her vow and remain a virgin, and at the same time she became a mother, the mother of God. This singular privilege was not without its concomitant sufferings, though. In order to receive her ultimate desire, which was to live with God and have Him live definitively in her, she had to suffer. She did not exactly have the kind of life we might suppose the Mother of God would have. Shouldn't it have been that because our Lord was God, that He would protect her from all harm and give her a pleasant life on this earth of prayer and of peace? But her life was not that way. She conceived at a young age and was subject to ridicule from her kindred and her neighbors. St. Joseph was a poor laborer and so his family lived very much hand to mouth. They did not have financial security. Her husband died when she was around 45 years old, making her a young widow. And then her divine son left home at the same time, quite apart from the fact that he spent more time with his disciples and his friends than he did with her, once he had begun his public ministry. He never returned home and died a terrible death at the impetus of Jewish priests. Some of the same priests who had welcomed her when she was presented in the temple and lived there during her maidenhood. And after his resurrection and ascension, she left her home, country, and lived in a foreign land for the rest of her life, separated from her family. And there she learned of the destruction of the temple, which is a place very dear to her heart. We can see from this brief synopsis that Our Lady's life was not easy. It was actually very hard. And though she was the sinless mother of God, she did not receive a free pass to heaven. She still had to labor and to suffer, but she knew that the divine plan was not without purpose and that he would be faithful, giving her grace to endure each new trial that came upon her, and ultimately he would reward her for her fidelity to him. Her words on the day of the visitation, which we heard in the gospel, were words that she repeated over and over again in her life and which reached their fulfillment in her assumption today. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. The first reading for this Mass is taken from the book of Judith, which recounts the story of another strong Jewish woman favored by God. This holy widow took it upon herself to put aside her security and risk her life to save her people. The Assyrians, it says, had besieged Jerusalem, demanding its surrender. When she slipped through the guard at the city walls, gained the confidence of the foreign general Holofernes, and then cut off his head one night when he became drunk and slept. 
Judith is a figure of the Blessed Virgin because she took upon herself the welfare of the nation and even of the world. As we heard, for you have not spared your life by reason of the distress and tribulation of your people, but you have prevented our ruin in the presence of our God. Judith, like Our Lady, was willing to stand in the breach at a critical time in human history. And though she might have preferred a quieter life, she made herself the handmaid of the Lord and did his bidding. And God used her to save his nation. There are similarities to Judith's case to our own day. The devil, we can say, is drunk on the disorder of the world. He has laid siege to the church and expects victory through those who war with him. But yet again, as he has done so many times, he, over, he underestimates his opponent. The devil will not have victory, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But each of us must do our part in this battle. We must bear our cross and follow Christ just as Mary did. We cannot waste time complaining about what we suffer or how bad our age is. Those things are true, but we lose valuable time when we worry and when we fear. In the case of Judith and in the case of Our Lady, the Lord defeated Satan by the work of one woman who was open to doing his will with courage and long suffering. And so how much more will he conquer in his body the church, for whom he has shed his blood and for whom he awaits in glory? Judith spent time in concocting her plan to defeat whole affairness. But I dare say that Our Lady did not think too much about how to defeat the devil. It was too big a task, and so she left it to God. She simply did what she needed to do day in and day out, and she believed that he would use her fidelity to win the victory. Some of us may be called to be Judiths, but most of us are like Our Lady. The Lord does not expect us to come up with a grand plan of how we will defeat secularism and the culture of death and modernism in the church. He just asks us to be faithful, to be willing to put aside our worldly fear, and to march forward towards heaven. We can alter the rest of Our Lady's song, the Magnificat, to express our faith in the Lord's victory over sin and death and lies, because there's so many lies in this world. She said, the Lord has showed might in his arm. He has scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. But we can say in union with her, the Lord will show might in his arm. He will scatter the proud in their conceit of their heart. He will put down the mighty from their thrones and he will exalt the humble. He will fill the hungry with good things, and he will send the rich away empty. May these words of Our Lady be ever on our lips, and may her faith be ever in our hearts. Until with her we crush the head of the ancient serpent, and inherit that kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world, which is the new Jerusalem, where every tear will be wiped from our eyes, and we will reign forever and ever. Please stand for the creed.